WebGPU, the new graphics API for creating 3D imagery and performing calculations on the GPU for the web. It adds support for modern GPU features and more advanced faster rendering capabilities. Eventually, it will replace the current web graphics API, WebGL. In this video, I'll walk through my process of making a 3D website using WebGPU. My ultimate goal is to create an updated portfolio website. I want to make something that stands out, and as someone who loves working with 3D graphics, what better way than to use this shiny new graphics API? When it comes to making a 3D website, there is no standard or expectations like with regular 2D websites. Those websites generally have a center section, a header, a footer, and maybe a side panel. In fact, if one is making a 3D website, that is an indication that you're already going above and beyond to be creative, since everything you need to display information is already present in regular websites. Because of this, I don't expect any kind of 3D website layout standards anytime soon, so I'm going to have to think outside the box. I wasn't sure where to start, so I decided to get some inspiration from some already existing 3D websites. Next, I'll highlight a few of my favorites. Starting off with Choo Choo World. I mostly just love the look of this one. I love the attention to detail, and the fun, brightly colored environment full of happy dancing trees. Not that the trains are relevant to what I'm on the lookout for, but I like them too. Another, Pilot.Auto, has a scroll to move feature where every time you scroll, the camera angle changes and the text updates. This works really well in my opinion, and I considered doing something like this. In the quarry house, you scroll to move, click and drag to look around, and can click on objects to move towards them. I really like this because it takes advantage of the 3D space to allow the user to interact with the environment in a non-linear manner, while still keeping the user on a linear path if they're unsure where to go next. In Magical Reflections, the environment is beautiful. Being able to scroll to move, click and drag to look around, and clicking on paintings to see their descriptions is amazing. This site layout is pretty similar to what I decided to go with. The links to all these websites will be in the description. Key to a 3D website is an impactful experience that sticks in people's minds. That means the 3D environment is the number one priority. I really wanted to evoke a unique feeling for the environment. I wanted it to stick out and be memorable, something that resonates with people in a way they aren't expecting. I did some research and gave it some thought, and I decided to go with something inspired by things I've loved from other 3D environments to create a colorful yet atmospheric world. I love the colors and the semi-low poly look of Luncheon Kingdom from Mario Odyssey, as well as the low poly aesthetic of the background in Sonic the Fighters, the mystical atmospheric glow of Blue Peas at night in Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild, and the beginning area of Majora's Mask with its floating glowing particles and liminal forest. With all that in mind, I began working on creating the website. But before I could start making 3D art, I needed to get coding. Despite the fact that WebGPU uses JavaScript, it works very similar to other graphics APIs, meaning this isn't going to be a walk in the park. To start, I set up a new node project, installed TypeScript for coding, Webpack to compile the code into minified JS, and the HTTP server package for testing. I also installed WebGPU types for TypeScript, so I could use TypeScript with WebGPU. Once I had all my packages installed, I opened the project in Visual Studio Code and got to work. The first thing to do was the hello world of 3D graphics. What that is, is rendering a single triangle with each of its corners sporting either red, green, or blue, creating a rainbow effect. But as with other graphics APIs like Vulkan, WebGPU requires setting up all of the parts one by one rather than working almost out of the box like OpenGL. But I luckily stumbled upon a repository called WebGPU Seed, which has everything needed to render a triangle. Now you may say, ah, well, that's cheating. Don't worry, it's not, and I'll explain why. When learning a graphics API, the most difficult part is getting set up, and due to the complexity of the systems, it makes it not conducive to learning. You want to spend as little time as possible setting up the code, and spend as much time working with the API, learning by making modifications as needed. You won't really start to understand how the systems work until you have everything set up and running, and you've been making changes as needed. And now with GPU Seed, I can render the triangle, the hello world of graphics programming. The next step was to render a cube. This may seem like a simple process, just replace the triangle with a cube. But actually, the way WebGPU C is set up, the triangle is being rendered in 2D space, normally called clip space. We will have to use matrices to convert the 3D cube from world space to clip space. If we want an orthographic view, we'd use an orthographic matrix. But if we want a perspective view, we need to use a perspective matrix. I'll need to generate these view matrices using specialized functions and then multiply the cube's vertices by the resulting matrix to get the 2D representation you see on the screen. I can either make my own functions to generate matrices or I can use a pre-existing library. With WebGL, there was GL matrix. It can work with WebGPU, but there are some fundamental differences between WebGL and WebGPU and how depth is managed that I would need to account for. 
Thankfully, however, with some searching I was able to find WGPU Matrix. It's a fantastic library that contains just about everything needed for matrices in WebGPU. After some effort working with the libraries and the code, I got matrices working, giving me the power to do all kinds of things including moving the camera, moving objects in 3D space. Here I have a cube moving up and down and while the camera is spinning around it. The next step, lighting. For testing purposes, I reused my Lambertian shader. If you don't know what Lambertian shading is, I'm planning on making a video on it in the future, but for now just know that it is a very simple way to simulate lighting. Using the shader was not as simple as just bringing it into the project. I had to convert it from GLSL to WebGPU's shading language, or WGSL for short. After getting the shader working, it was clear the cube's normals were completely messed up. In case you don't know what normals are, put simply, they're a representation of the direction a surface is facing. Having this information is important when calculating lighting, because it is used to determine how much light hit the surface. I fixed the normals, and now you can see the lighting on the spinning cube. After that came quite the doozy, importing meshes. First I had to select a file type to use. There were a couple different contenders, like OBJ or FBX, but in the end I decided to go with GLTF. GLTF was designed to be a general use case 3D file particularly for WebGL, making it the natural choice since WebGPU has no file type designated for it yet, or at least at the time of making this video. One thing WebGPU has over WebGL are render bundles. But before I explain what a render bundle is, you need to know that a draw call is when the CPU tells the GPU to render something. Making a single draw call is fine, but when there are thousands of objects in a scene, each object will require its own draw call. This can get quite expensive, causing lag due to the number of draw calls. The benefit of a render bundle is that it reduces the number of draw calls needed by bundling many different objects into a single draw call. With render bundles, thousands of draw calls can be reduced to just one, reducing rendering times substantially for large scenes. I looked into implementing render bundles into my importer, but the deeper I got into it, the more I realized that it was not a simple task. Even to set up an importer for a GLTF file was not going to be easy. Being a general use case file for holding up to one or more 3D scenes, which break down into nodes and meshes, I decided to make a simple importing tool that takes the first mesh and the first node of the first scene. I may add more features as needed in the future, but in my opinion it is best to import things only as needed. As a test, I imported the monkey head from Blender, whose name, if you don't know, is Suzanne. Looks pretty cool here in my opinion, but maybe I'm just glad that I finally got this working. After getting my mesh importer working, I made a test pathway for the camera to move down. In order to have the camera move along the path, I needed to implement a curve for it to follow. This involves a decent amount of math. I initially decided to go with NURBS, because I wanted to try something new and I don't have any experience programming them. This turned out to be a mistake. I am using Blender as an editor for the curve, so it needs to work the same way in Blender as it does on my website. The way Blender implements NURBS paths is kept fairly abstract within the editor. I tried looking at the source code, and when I couldn't quickly figure out how NURBS were implemented, I decided to switch to Bezier curves. They are much simpler to implement, and I have already implemented them before. The way they work is fairly universal. I can easily make changes in Blender, import those changes into my website, and they should work exactly the same. After a lot of coding and math, I finally got a working path the camera can move along. Then I added the ability to use the scroll position to move along the path. After that, I added points of interest. As you approach them, the camera turns to look at them. This also took a lot of coding and math to get working. Well, unfortunately, that is it for now. This project is taking much longer than I anticipated it would, but once I have finished the website, I'll make a part 2 going over the rest of the process. I've learned a lot so far, and I hope you enjoyed coming along this journey with me. If you did, please leave a like. Comment down below something you'd like to see me work on. Subscribe and hit the bell so you can get notified when my next video comes out. If you'd like to support these videos and other things I create in the future, consider becoming a patron. Link in the description. I also found many tutorials that helped me along the way, which I'll put in the description as well. Goodbye for now.